The Challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> it's King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the North Country, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On, you husky! Gold. Gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the greedy race for riches. Now back to the days of the gold rush when Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog King battled through storm and snow to preserve law and order as they met the challenge of the Yukon. The Gold Nugget Cafe in Dawson City was crowded as usual. In one corner of the room, four men sat playing poker. One of the players was a big man who sat silently wearing a fur cap with the ear laps pulled down, though the room was hot and stuffy. Dan Wilkins, the man sitting next to him, was talkative and good-natured. He turned to the man in the fur cap while the cards were being dealt. Well, you hardly said a word all evening, stranger. You just got into town today, didn't you? Yeah. Well, you must be getting kind of warm in here with that fur cap pulled down around your ears. Why don't you take it off? Because I don't feel like it. Maybe he's bullheaded and don't want us to know it. <laughs> I don't think it's anybody's business. Oh, you've just been drinking too much. It spoils your sense of humor. Are you going to play poker or just sit there and blab? Hey, drinking makes you kind of nasty, don't it? You're enough to make anyone lose his temper without drinking. <laughs> I think if we took that fur cap off him, he'd feel better. <laughs> there, I got it. <laughs> give me that cap, you fool. I said give it to me. Oh. It'll teach you to mind your own business. Hey, there wasn't a call for that. What did he do to you? He hit Dan. Listen, stranger, that wasn't necessary. What's wrong with you, anyway? And what are you going to do about it, smart Alec? I'll show you. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, hey, he shot Pete. Now stand back, all of you. I'll give you a taste of this lead. Don't anybody try to come out of this place. Here, somebody get a all right? Stand back, he's shot. Somebody get a doctor. Somebody get a The following morning at the headquarters of the Northwest Mounted Police, Inspector Grayson listened carefully to Sergeant Preston, who stood before him with his big lead dog, King, at his side. By the time I got to the Gold Nugget Cafe, the man who pulled a gun on Pete had disappeared. I searched the town, but there was no sign of him. Have you a good description of him, Sergeant? When Dan pulled his cap off, sir, the men noticed that half of his left ear was gone. That must have been why he kept the sides of his cap pulled down. A strange thing to be sensitive about up here in the Yukon, where so many have lost their ears entirely from freezing. He also had a long scar, as if he'd been grazed by a bullet on his right cheek. Scar on his right cheek? Uh, just a minute, Sergeant. The poor from Whitehorse just came in this morning. Wait, uh... Oh, yes, yes. Here it is. I wonder if this man could be the one that they're looking for. Tall and slim, scar, bullet wound on right cheek. Part of left ear missing. That's the man, Sergeant. What's he wanted for, sir? For murder in Montreal. Hmm. Seems he killed his employer, the owner of a circus. This man worked in the sharpshooting act. So that's why he was so handy with a gun. They say he's very dangerous, very quick-tempered, accurate with a gun. Uh, it's too bad we didn't have this report earlier. We might have prevented what happened last night. Will Dan live? I think so, sir. We must get this man as soon as possible. Now, we may have left town, but look here first. He could be hiding out in a cabin somewhere. I'm putting you on the assignment, Sergeant. Find him. I'll do my best, sir, but uh, it may take some time. He'll know we're looking for him. You'll get him all right, Sergeant. You always do. You and that dog of yours. West of Dawson in the town of Forty Mile, old Jim Bruce stood talking to a friend of his at the bar in the Northern Lights Cafe. Jim was a bachelor and owned one of the richest gold claims in the vicinity. Suddenly, a man standing next to him bumped against him. Hey, steady there, mister. Hey, what's the idea of shoving me? Oh, I didn't shove you. You were the one who bumped me. Guess you're a little unsteady on your feet, partner. Oh, so you think I've had too much to drink. I don't pay any attention to him, Jim. He's a little top-heavy. You shoved me and you said I was drunk. <laughs> well, mister, if I shoved you and you're not drunk, there's something wrong with my eyesight. <laughs> Calling me a liar and saying I shouldn't have anything more to drink. Why, I'll you... I'll listen, stranger, if you take that fur cap off and uncover your ears, maybe you'd find out what's being said. Oh, Jim, don't talk to him. He's getting ugly. What I wear on my head is my business. Sure, it's your business. Now, go ahead and mind it. But listen, you old fathead. You 
trying to get out of this argument. Barney, why don't you throw this pest out of here? I'll show you who'll get out of here. Back where I come from, this is how we settle things. This gun. Hey, he's pulling the gun. Look out. Move oh, my hand. Stop that gun. Oh, 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 you smoke, Jim. Somebody sure saved your life. That was close. I'll say it was close. Who did it? I did it, mister. A woman. That girl shot that gun. Oh, she must have. It came from that table. Can you beat that? Think you're pretty smart, don't you, sister? Well, you can just buy me a new gun. You smashed that one all to pieces. Listen, you big balloon. You better get out of this cafe before I start clipping the ends off your mustache with this gun of mine. <laughs> now, now, kid, you come back to our table. You shouldn't have got us into this. Tain't ladylike, all these men. Grandpa, go sit down. It's anybody's business to save a man from getting killed. All right, you. Get out of here like I said. Why, you yeah, little... Yeah, get out like the lady said, or we'll give you some help. Yeah. Come on, boys. Let's help him if you won't go. I'll get those. You'll be sorry for this lady, whoever you are. I uh, sure want to thank you, miss, for saving my life. That was mighty good shooting. Oh, that's all right, mister. I saw him pull that gun on you, and I... I did it without thinking. Yes, come on over and sit at our table, mister. Uh, I'd be glad to. Poor Grandpa. I guess you haven't eaten your supper. Uh, you're going to get us in trouble with that gun of yours, kid. Oh, Grandpa. I uh, guess I'd better introduce myself. I'm Jim Bruce. And I'm Kit Brown. This is my Grandpa, Andy Brown. I do. You two just get to 40 Mile? Yes. We sold our ranch in the States. We heard about this gold rush, and nothing would satisfy Kit till we took a crack at it. Ain't like we thought, though. What do you mean? According to the stories we heard, all you had to do was come up here and dig a hole and there was gold. <laughs> no, I'm afraid it's a little harder than that. It sure is. We went to Dawson first, but couldn't even find a place to stay. Thought we'd try this town, but it's just as bad. Why, they charge a dollar just to sleep on the floor with about 50 other people. Well, you mean you can't find a room in any hotels? Everything's packed to the roof. Even if we had enough money to pay for it, we couldn't find a place. Food so plagued high, just about all our cash is used up. Grandpa, you don't have to tell all our private business. If you'd have used your head a few minutes ago, maybe we'd have got enough money to get along on. Why, what do you mean? Well, you see, Mr. Bruce, nobody ever thinks a woman can shoot. Not many of them can. Kit can always earn money by getting in a shooting contest with somebody and betting she can beat him. I always tell them I'm a good shot, but they don't believe it. We always win. Because Kit here can now shoot any man I ever see. Now she went and spoiled it all. Grandpa, keep still. I couldn't let that man kill Mr. Bruce right in front of my eye. Well, no, I guess you couldn't rightly do that. You mean nobody will get into a shooting match with Kit now, huh? That's it. This story will fly all over town like wildfire. We won't get anybody to shoot again in our, let alone betting on it. We won't even have money in our keys or a place to live. Of course, you're forgetting the fact that this little lady just saved my life. Huh? You mean you're going to reward her? Now, Grandpa, don't say that. You know I couldn't accept money for anything like that. Well, I was just asking. Well, if it embarrasses you to take money, I'd like to propose something else. I live all alone out here in a big cabin. You're both welcome to come out and stay until we can figure something out for you. Oh, no, that, that's too much to ask. Uh, maybe to be Are easier... Are you a prospector? Yep, got a very good gold claim, and I could use some help. Maybe your grandfather here could help me work it, and uh, I could take some shooting lessons from you, young lady. I don't know a thing about guns, and that's a handy thing to know around here. That's mighty nice of you, Mr. Bruce. Uh, but, Kit, do you think... Now, that... Grandpa, we may as well admit we're in a bad spot. Mr. Bruce is a lifesaver. I don't know how to thank you, Mr. Bruce. We'll sure be happy to accept your hospitality. Why, you're the one who's the lifesaver. Now, you two get your baggage and move right out to my cabin. And I'll teach you all I know about shooting. <laughs> two days later, in the claim office at 40 Mile, Jed Smith, the prospector, stood at the desk talking to the claim clerk. I hear Jim Bruce didn't do a thing about that man that pulled a gun on him in the Northern Lights Cafe the day before yesterday. Uh, Jim says maybe the man is only threatening him. <laughs> anyway, he'd had too much to drink. I guess that little lady completely ruined his forty-five. And there's a fancy shooting I ever saw. Knocked the gun right out of his hand. Well, speak of the devil. He's a man in fur cap now. Howdy. 
Well, hello. I'm Jace Ray. I came in to file a claim on the Fox River. Well, you strike something already? I think so. Uh, whereabouts on the Fox River are you locating? Uh, right at the bend. There's an old abandoned shack right there. I'm repairing it. You don't mean it. Why, why there's no gold around there, Rankin. That used to be my claim. I abandoned it a long time ago. Your claim? Oh, I don't own it anymore. Only there's no use of you wasting your time around there. I prospected ever into that. Well, I, I guess you just weren't very thorough. I hit a streak of pay to oh, it. did it? <laughs> well, golly, Jed, the boys will sure have a laugh on you. Leaving a claim and having a tenderfoot come in and find gold there. Uh, I just can't believe it. I... I guess maybe I'm just luckier than you are, that's all. Now, uh... You mind drawing up them papers? Oh, I'd be glad to. The boys will sure get the laugh on me. Now, listen, Rankin, uh, don't spread the story around. Uh, and you, Bob, you know how the boys will rag me. Uh, please don't tell them. Oh, I won't tell them, Jed. You'd never hear the last of them. Uh, thanks. And uh, you, Rankin? And don't worry about me. I don't mix much with people. I just as soon they didn't know about it. I don't want any neighbors moving in around me. I'll be glad to keep it a secret. Thanks, boys. I sure appreciate that. It was a week later. Jim Bruce sat in a comfortable chair before the stove while Kit busied herself making hot tea. Kit, you're spoiling me, fussing around the way you're doing, and all I got's just a little cold. The time to cure a cold is when it begins. Now, you drink this tea and warm your inside. Mm, thanks. I should be working at the mine with your grandfather. There's nothing wrong with me. Sit in the house for two whole days and letting you baby me? It's silly. High time somebody took care of you. You go out and work in that cold mine and you'll really be sick. Your grandpa's the one who should be sitting here instead of me. That shoulder of his gives him lots of trouble. Grandpa's had that sore shoulder for so long he's used to it. I wish he was more help to you. Well, even though he can't get much gold out of that mine, it makes him happy to be working. I've decided I'm going to give him all he takes out. Ain't enough to worry about. You're going to do no such thing. We've got to do something to pay for our board and keep. You're teaching me to shoot, ain't you? And you're helping me around the house. I never realized how lonesome I was living here all by myself till you and your grandpa come to live with me. Have you any family, Mr. Bruce? Yeah, I've got a brother. But I haven't seen him for nigh on to 30 years. Well, I guess I'll start calling you Uncle Jim. And pretend I'm part of your family. Oh, I'd like that, kid. If I'd had a granddaughter, she'd be just about your age, I reckon. Oh, someone's coming. What? That sounds like Sergeant Preston. Sergeant Preston? Who is he? He's an old friend of mine, a Mountie. A Mountie? Well, now you just sit down and I'll let him in. Don't you do it. Think I want him laughing at me for pretending I'm sick? <laughs> I'll let him in. How are you, Sergeant Preston? Thought that was your voice. Come on in. Bring King. One thing. What brings you up to 40 Mile? Story I heard about you. Oh, oh uh, Sergeant, this is Kit Brown. It's Sergeant Preston. How do you do? Howdy. Uh, is that dog of yours dangerous? No, not at all. He never bites women. You don't have to be afraid. He's about the smartest dog I ever saw. He understands everything the sergeant says. <laughs> don't you, boy? These big wolf dogs up here scare me. I'm not used to them. Kit's a newcomer up here, Sergeant. Or oh, uh, take your park off and sit down. I'll pour you a cup of tea. I just made some. Oh, thanks. I could use it. I'll uh, hang this right here. What did you mean when you said you came up here on account of a story you heard about me? Well, Jim, uh, Bill Faye came to Dawson a few days ago and told us a story about a girl saving you from getting shot at the Northern Lights Cafe. Well, the story's true, Sergeant, and Kit here is the girl that done it. Well, miss, you're to be congratulated. That was very accurate shooting. Oh, I wasn't far away. I couldn't miss. Kit's the best shot I ever saw. She beats any man I know. Well, except maybe you, Sergeant. Did you get a good look at this man? There was too much excitement. Everything happened so fast. Why did this story bring you up here, Sergeant? Because I'm after a man who did something very similar in Dawson. Except that his victim didn't have the good fortune to have Kit nearby. Got shot. What? Well, you don't mean it. And you think it's the same man? Well, Bill remembered vaguely what he looked like. The description fitted the man I'm looking for. His actions fitted, too. Quick temper, heavy drinker, and handy with a gun. Shuck, Sergeant. This man sure wasn't handy with a gun. Oh? He fumbled around and took so long getting it aimed that I had plenty of time to plug it. Remember, Kit, he'd been drinking. 
And you don't call anyone handy with a gun unless he can draw like greased lightning. I spent a week trying to trace him in Dawson, but he must have left the night he shot Pete. This is the first lead I've had. We haven't seen hide nor hair of him since. Of course, we haven't been into town. I stopped at the Northern Lights Cafe in town. Nobody to seen or heard anything of him. I doubt that he stayed around here very long. He probably went over the border. Uh, did the man he shot in Dawson die? No, he didn't. But he's also wanted for a murder in Montreal. Gosh, you Mounties sure cover territory fast, don't you? We have to. Anyway, you'd better be careful, kid. This man's dangerous. If he's hiding around here somewhere, he might want to get even with him for what you did. Let him try it. The next time I take a shot at him, I won't be aiming at his gun. You did make a fool out of him, Kit. And the next time, I'll make a sieve out of him. <laughs> well, seriously, I'd stay close to the house if I were you. Yeah, you better quit taking walks through the woods the way you do. Don't you worry about me. I'm not afraid of any two-penny varmint who goes around shooting at old men. I guess she's right. She'd be a match for him. I guess I better go down and get Grandpa now. He never knows what time it is. <laughs> You'll be staying for supper, won't you, Sergeant? Why, uh, thanks, but I'd better not. I've got to go back to town and question some people. Maybe I'll have better luck tonight. Well, we'll be seeing a lot of you while you're here, I hope. You're a darn tootin' we will. You'd better spend some time with us, or I'll know the reason why. That night, a light snow was falling as Sergeant Preston walked along the main street of 40 Mile. <laughs> Suddenly, a dog team drew up and stopped beside him. Oh, oh you hustle. Oh. Hey, Mon. Yes? I'm Bob Jenkins, clerk at the claims office. Yes? A friend of mine's just been shot about two miles from here east of town. Can you come back with me, Sergeant? Oh, yes, right away. I'll leave the dogs in my sled here. I got a heavy load. Been on a hunting trip. There's Sam Peavy. He'll take care of them for me. We'll go straight back. Who's the man who's been shot? His name is Jed Smith. <laughs> Cabin much farther? We're almost there. And you say you can't think of anyone who might want to murder Jed? He didn't have an enemy in the world. Mm. I was his best friend, Sergeant. I'd know if anyone would. Well, did he have any money? Did somebody have killed him and robbed him? Well, he had a claim, but it wasn't much good. Well, Jed just had bad luck, that's all. He had a claim that he thought was worthless, and he left it. Some lucky stiff from outside came in and found gold on it. And Jed swore there wasn't a smell of gold on the place. The poor fella, he wouldn't let me tell anyone i afraid they don't laugh at him. Well, didn't the man who found it tell people? I know. He's the one who got into that shooting scrape with Jim Bruce. Never comes to town, and well, he said he wouldn't say anything to anyone. You mean the man that had the gun shot out of his hand by that girl? Well, yeah, yeah, that's the one. What well, didn't anybody in town tell you I was looking for him? Well, I haven't been in town for three days. I was on a hunting trip. That's why I happened to stop at Jed's on the way home. Now, where is this claim of Jed's? Fox Creek, the other side of town. Old shack on it. Say, uh... Is the man's name Rankin? His real name is Mason. Can you remember if he had a scar on his right cheek above his beard? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the one. And did you notice whether the top of his left ear is missing? I never saw him without his fur cap, and always had the ear laps pulled down. That's our man. Does anyone except you know that he's living on Fox Creek? I have never told anybody on account of Jed. Jed was the only one that knew. Maybe it's a good thing you weren't in town tonight. You might have had a bullet in you by now. Yeah, but... Why would he file a claim like that if he was going to hide out? He must have done it to keep anyone else from coming there. And he must have had some other reason. You and Jed were the only ones who knew he was living in that cabin, weren't you? Well, as far as I know, we were. Hmm. He knew we wouldn't tell anyone on account of Jed's being a laughing stock for leaving a good claim. I think you'd better stay with me tonight, Bob, for your own safety. Here's Jed's cabin. Now, there's no use looking for tracks around it. The snow's covered everything. Let's go in. One in, King. <laughs> I left the light burning. It. There's Jed's body, Sergeant. Uh, shot in the head. No sign of a struggle. Well, yeah, Jed sure didn't suspect the man that did it. I don't see why Rankin would want to kill him. Rankin, as you call him, may have heard some way that I was in town looking for him. You and Jed were the only ones who knew he was still here. He wasted no time quieting Jed. You might have been next. That's why you want me to stay with you tonight? Yes, Bob. And tomorrow morning, I want you to show me where Rankin's cabin is. Look at that dog, Sergeant. I bet he knows the man we're after. Yeah, and if he could talk, it'd help, too. King can almost talk. And I think he knows the man I'm looking for right now. The following morning, 
Bob and Sergeant Preston went to the cabin of the man who called himself Jace Rankin. The Mountie left his dog team in town, but King was close at his side. As they cautiously approached the cabin, Sergeant Preston noticed footprints in the new fallen snow. I guess we don't have to be too careful, Bob. These tracks lead away from the cabin, and there aren't any leading back. Yeah, you're right, Sergeant. Guess we got here a little too late. It's gone. Let's have a look at his cabin anyway. Doors unlocked. Uh, nobody home, though. Sure is a dirty place. Here's some old shovels and a pickaxe. It's thick with rust. Well, he sure hasn't been doing any mining with those. You know, uh, I can't understand why he's staying here. The border's so close, he could have been well into Alaska by this time. Say, here's an old tool chest. Wonder what's in it. It's locked. Locked? Now, wait, I'll shoot the lock off. This might explain <laughs> a lot of things. Get back, King. Hey, that did it. Yeah, I'll open it. Look. Oh, it's full of white rock. Why, it's gold. That rock's laced with gold. Gold from a very rich vein. Come on, Bob. We're following those tracks. I'm beginning to be worried about Jim and Kit. Yeah, we better find this man fast. These tracks lead right in the direction of Jim Bruce's mine. You think he's been stealing gold from that claim? Maybe. I'm worried about Jim and Kit, Bob. He may be trying to harm them some way. I wonder if I ought to go to their cabin first. Well, you want me to go over there and see, Sergeant? The cabin's about a quarter of a mile through the woods. Tell you what to do, Bob. You take King with you. If Kit's in the cabin, leave the dog with her for protection. I'll go straight to the mine from here. What if she's not there? Well, then just tell King to find me. He will. You think he'll go with me? He will if I tell him to. Go with Bob, King. <laughs> Come on, King. Go with him, fella. Go on. <laughs> As Sergeant Preston approached the mine shaft that led into a hillside, he heard the voices of Kit and a strange man. A light was burning inside the shaft, and the Mountie walked toward it softly. Now, you're getting out here, I tell you. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not taking orders. I've given them. I'm staying right here. And I say you're leaving. The lady's right, Mason. You're leaving with me. You're under arrest. Mountie. Sergeant Preston. And over that gun, Mason. Thanks. I've been trailing you for a long time, ever since you shot Dan Wilkins in Dawson. I don't know what you're talking about. My name's Rankin. That's the name you've been going by in 40 Mile. Come on, you're coming with me. Just a minute, Mountie. Put up your what? hands. What? Put them up, I say. You know how well I can shoot. <laughs> you didn't know we were partners, did you, Mountie? I keep them covered, Kit. I'll take that gun out of his holes. No, you don't. Don't move my arm. Don't move or I'll break it. Don't shoot, Kit. You'll hit me. You'll make a good shield. Don't. You shoot at me, you'll kill him, Kit. You move fast, don't you, Sergeant? But I guess you forget how well I can shoot. Jace ain't covering all of you. You're too big. Now hold still, Jace, and I'll pick him off around the edges. No, Kit. Don't shoot. You'll kill me. Don't go yellow on me now. I used to shoot cigarettes out of your mouth. The time I shot the top off your ear, I meant to do it. Now hold still. There goes your hat, Mountie. You shouldn't have ducked. This time I'll get you. At Jim's cabin, Bob had turned King back when he found Kit was not there. The great dog retraced his trail to the point where Preston had left him and then sped like an arrow in the direction of the mine. As he approached, he heard the sound of gunshots. Sensing that his master was in danger, raced madly into the entrance and leaped straight at the hand that held the gun blazing at the Mountie. You said he wouldn't fight a woman. He will, if she's trying to kill me. So you were part of all this. I'm getting to understand things now. This is why Mason was staying in 40 Mile. You can't prove a thing. Your grandfather's in on this, too. Well, Mason seems to be coming, too. How did that dog of yours get here? I sent him up to Jim's cabin to protect you. When you weren't there, they sent him back to me. He got here just in time. Come on, Kit. You and Mason and I are going back to the cabin and find your grandfather. When Sergeant Preston entered Jim Bruce's cabin with his two prisoners, Jim rushed toward them. I'm so glad you got to the mine in time, Sergeant. Are you all right, Kit? 
Bob told me they'd track this man. Jim, I'm afraid I have something to tell you that's going to be rather a shock. A shock? Kit and Mason here are partners. Partners? What do you mean? Why, Kit shot the gun out of his hand when he tried to shoot me in the cafe that day. That was all part of their scheme. It was all planned. Kit used to work with Mason in a sharpshooting act in Montreal. What? Why, I can't believe it. It's not true. It was a clever idea, all right, Kit. Getting in with Jim the way you did. Keeping him up here at the cabin, teaching him to shoot. While your grandfather and Mason took all the gold they could get out of his mine. You mean this man was working in my mine with old Andy? And they were carrying what they took out of it back to his cabin. But they knew I'd find out about it soon. That's one thing I can't quite figure out. Where's Kit's grandfather? Oh, Andy was here just before you came. He went back into the bedroom. Oh, to... Stick up your hands, what? all of you. The shotgun will blow the brains off anyone who tries anything. No, Grandpa. Don't shoot that gun. It'll kill you. Drop it. What? What do you mean? Give me that gun, Andy. Don't shoot it, Grandpa. What's wrong with it? We'll soon find out. Oh. It's a good thing you didn't shoot this gun, Andy. It would have blown your head off. Why, that's the gun I was going to learn to shoot this afternoon. Oh? Kit said I'd do better with a shotgun. And Kit had fixed the gun with enough explosives to blow your head off when you pulled the trigger. So that was it, Kit. That's why you wanted me to leave here. You were going to kill the old man off so you and Crabbit could keep the gold mine for yourself. Shut up, Jay. I won't shut up. That's why you told me yesterday that Sergeant Preston was looking for me. So that's how you found it out. And that's why you killed Jed Smith, Mason. So he couldn't tell me where you were. He's a fool. He's always too ready to use that gun of his. If it hadn't been for you, Jace, we'd never have been caught. And if my dog hadn't got to the mine in time, I wouldn't be here to put you all under arrest. I'm doing that right now, all three of you. Get ready, you're coming with me. I told you, Kit, we should have got rid of that killer. Shut up, you old colluder. Get over there, Andy, and all three of you be quiet. I, uh, I don't know how to thank you, Sergeant. They sure had me fooled. If it hadn't been for you and King... We're, uh, both indebted to King, Jim. Yes, old fella. Thanks to you, the case is closed. The Challenge of the Yukon, a copyrighted feature, is brought to you each week at this time, and all characters, names, and incidents used are fictitious. Listen again next week to another exciting adventure during the days of the gold rush. L. Prow speaking. This program came to you from Detroit. Have you ever had this feeling? You've had an emotion you couldn't describe, perhaps a painting that's moved you, or an exciting play. But try as you will, you can't convey that feeling to anyone else. Most of us have had that experience, and we think that you'll feel that way when you hear ABC's program... The greatest story ever told. On the air every Sunday night. It marks a new departure in radio entertainment. For it's a dramatic program that cannot be described in words alone. It's one you'll hear and thrill to. The American Broadcasting Company invites you to hear The Greatest Story Ever Told tomorrow. We think you'll agree that there has never been anything as moving in radio entertainment. The Greatest Story Ever Told 